Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to all our listeners and everyone that now watches us on YouTube. Uh, thank you for coming along. Thank you for listening. Um, another episode of The Edge. I think we're getting up towards 40, 45 episodes, something like that. So quite a lot. So thank you. Our listeners are, are definitely growing. We'll get more, more and more people listening, which is great. Um, we have another guest with us today, Chris Fallon. Um, thank you very much for coming along, Chris. Um, the first question, as always, on my podcast is going to be kind of, how did you get started? Where, where did you where did you start your career? And that kind of how did you get to where you are today? Uh, get started. So I was a kid in the Caribbean, um, fortunate enough to have um, parents that had a store with a computer and the island PC tech was either upgrading the RAM or the hard drive, but um, she had all the parts all over the office floor and I'm peeking in and going, what is this? Um, by the age of 12, I was spending my summers um, at the internet cafe, um, but instead of just streaming and surfing the web, I was helping with virus removals. I was helping with um, Windows 98 and 2000 upgrades. I was uh, kind of doing everything uh, for her. And that was, I guess, payment for spending all my time there. Um, eventually grew, grew up, um, hit 2000, uh, was deciding what to do for a career. And at the time, there were so many CS degrees that I refused to get uh, a, a CS degree myself. Um, one, I hate physics. I hate math. Uh, I hate all that stuff about uh, computer science. So I got uh, a business admin degree and kind of went down the entrepreneurial route um, into sales, uh, selling cell phones and cars and all sorts of stuff. Um, but then in 2008, when the economy crashed again, um, it was like, well, if I'm going to be grinding, might as well be grinding doing something fun. So I quit my sales job, um, didn't have another job lined up. I signed up to a place called New Horizons. And sometimes some of those boot camps are focused on passing, but um, I went there with a mission to learn. Um, I already knew the basics. So it was about reinforcing uh, the things that I didn't know, like um, operating in, in an enterprise environment and operating in that larger set of computing environments. Um, came through with A+, Net+, Set+, uh, MCSE, and then kind of jumped in my first help desk scroll. And on the first day, there's someone that had a post-it note, like with their password on the keyboard. And I'm like, there's got to be a better way. And that kind of started my passion into uh, cybersecurity or InfoSec. Um, I was formally on the IT side, but I did everything I could to advise the business to work on doing things in a safer way. And that has kind of been the theme of my career um, helping to enable the business to do things safely. So eventually I came into security consulting, helping uh, federal agencies, helping work in sovereign clouds, uh, helping assess all sorts of large companies um, from the exterior and now from the interior in a large fintech. But um, it still is the theme where I'm that middle connection link between the business and the devs or the engineers. I make the joke to the engineers that I could build infrastructure using JSON script, but you don't want your infrastructure running on my JSON script. Um, but I can use that knowledge to help translate what the business is looking for, uh, as well as advising them on how to develop things in a more secure fashion. I, there's a lot you've just said in that that I could I could kind of focus on, but the, the first thing I'm going to ask about is the is the boot camp situation. So I started off kind of 
my career go into the boot camp type situations and very much i think with the same mindset as you that i would go to learn i wanted to learn i wanted to pass an exam but fundamentally i wanted to gain the knowledge i wanted to learn because it made my life easier if i turn up at a job even the job i was in and i knew something and i'd learned something my day job became easier because it didn't get so much pressure however there were people on those boot camps that literally turn up learn how to pass the exam pass the exam and then I would go on another boot camp a couple of weeks or a couple of months later, and I'd be with the same group of people because it quite often happened that you you met the same group of people. And I'd be having a bit more of an easier life because I'd learned the technology and I kind of understood what I was doing or, or thought I understood what I was doing. And they'd be like, oh, it's really, really hard. I'm really struggling. I've got a new job and I'm really under pressure. And I was a bit younger back then, and, and now I'm a bit more outspoken. But even back then, I really just wanted to say, but you haven't learned anything. You've come here to learn to take the exam. You haven't learned the job. Like, I would take that knowledge and go home and have my home lab and practice the scenarios that I'd seen in the workplace. So I, I guess my question to you is, certifications for me are quite important. I like to have them. Mm -hmm. Do you see them being a little bit discredited with all these boot camps or if people go into the boot camp with the right mindset, could they still be useful? Uh, I'd say both. So um, one of the things that I do outside of my day job is um, this not for profit here, whole cyber human initiative. What we did is we created a uh, roadmap for individuals that are transitioning from other careers into cybersecurity and, and technology. And right now, most of them are veterans because we have several veterans, veteran founders, and we're also using open resources. So uh, we start out with an assessment to help place them where they might have some strengths within the cybersecurity color wheel and then kind of point them at the different uh, roles that uh, the NIST NICE framework has developed for the government. Not to say that these are the roles that they should go into, but these are the roles that they should investigate. They should go out. They should have informational interviews. They should talk to people in the industry and find out what's being um, expected of them and then take that and kind of do like a gap assessment to say, okay, well, I need these types of skills and um, studying for or taking a certification in this area will help me get those skills. And then also based on talking to hiring managers, they value these certifications. So yeah. you're getting that hands-on information. Now, certain industries like the DOD and um, other regulated industries may have preferences for a minimum set of certifications. And while that helps manage bigger contracts and things like that, it's influenced the private sector too much because they're just copying and pasting these requirements without fully understanding the depth of experience needed um, to, to kind of qualify for these, as well as whether the skills and competencies gained from the certification will even be useful in a role. Because get, having a CISSP for um, a SOC analyst, not very helpful, um, kind of overqualified, as well as it's not at the technical layer that they need to be successful in that role. Um, so that's the other thing that we do uh, in this nonprofit is that we help employers with um, creating helpful job descriptions, creating a, um, a helpful road for progress through the talent pipeline so that they can create, okay, uh, these are the expectations at this layer, and then this is the expectation at the next layer. That way they can ideally start from interns or very novices and have them progress up yeah. and have the ones above teach the other ones so that they have a full life cycle of individuals coming from green to more mature and they don't have to worry about trying to find that purple unicorn out there um, 
kind of do everything for them. See, see, for me, cyber is kind of mirroring what IT did, say, 30, 40 years ago. And what, because mm-hmm. I wasn't at the start of IT, but we were relatively close to the start. I mean, there was no internet when I kind of got into it. Computers were really only used for playing games, ZX Spectrum and stuff. So we could get in very early and the playing field we played on was very, very small. There was very little to do. There was nothing like there was no real email. There was no real kind of file servers. It was an ERP system and that was it. So we had the luxury of being able to grow and involve into that and also grow and involve in kind of understand a bit more about InfoSec and then security and now cybersecurity. We could kind of take that path. So we had the luxury of being able to do that. And I remember job adverts back then when I was applying were as bad as they are in cyber today because you would have an organization going, I need an IT person and they need to be able to do everything from wire the refrigerator to create a WAN. It was so vast. And I think we're at a similar place with cyber. So I think it's really good that people like yourselves are not only helping candidates understand where they would best fit and where possibly is a good opportunity for them to go, but also on the reverse side, helping companies understand that that job description is 20 different people. It's not one. And and fundamentally, there are still many, many companies out there where their IT team may be 50 to 100 people and they've got one security person. What they're not realizing is actually you probably need almost as many people that at least understand security as you do understand IT, because otherwise the IT infrastructure type people or the network people are the ones that are going to be inherently even by accident doing configurations that aren't secure so it needs to be kind of a a whole arena so i think it's really good to be able to match up candidates with kind of real world jobs Um, but john anything you want to want to add on that no, I think you hit on a few points there and and you know chris I, i i like what you did with your career i you didn't come out of directly and you said, hey, I don't want to go get a, a CS degree. I, I'm going to go get a business degree. And um, you knew you had a passion for, for computers and, and security as well. And being able to tie the two together and then bring it together, I believe you're in the fintech industry, uh, to be that broker between um, you know the technical folks and the business. I think there needs to be more of that in security because, uh, Jay, you mentioned it, um, a lot of the folks that are in security these days come out of the IT background. Maybe they're infrastructure people. Maybe they're firewall people. My history yeah. is a lot of them don't understand the business. They don't get it. They're they're focused on that that widget there, that process there. Uh, they don't get the whole context of, of the business and being able to tie that back together, you know, in a sense is it, it's, you know, in IT, it's, it's really a superpower. Yeah. And to, to add to that, um, the podcast that I also do, Breaking Into Cybersecurity, um, started from my journey of breaking in and the challenges that I had. And then we started uh, sharing the stories of others so that we can show how a teacher has broken in, how um, a physical therapist has broken in, how a librarian has broken in, but also to show the incredible diversity of people that are interested and want to come in and some of the challenges that they've faced along the way so that our viewers can pick up tips and tricks from them to make their journey easier. Uh, And and recently we've evolved to adding a leadership series where now we're having leaders share both what they are looking for in talent, as well as the skills and competencies that are required to be a successful leader. And most of the times, the the technical ones are at the bottom of the stack and things like communication, collaboration, influence, networking, those are the ones that rise to the top of the stack because it allows that security leader to be truly a part of the business and to understand what you're looking for to get sales, to produce widgets, to whatever drives that organization and help them create an infrastructure or an application that delivers on that. I love I love what you said there about soft skills. Um, I was out at a um private club if you want to call it that it's 
the whiskey library last night and meeting with some peers. And we were talking about uh, one of the guys that I was there with, he used to work with him. And we were talking about this change that has happened since uh, 2020, three years ago, about this time. And um, because we worked in a company that was, I'll say it, butts and seats, that's how they operated. There was no remote workforce. They didn't support it. And um, now he's working in a company that has transitioned mostly to this remote uh, style of work. And one of the challenges he says is, uh, he said is, it is that soft skills uh, because that person that you are working with directly uh, only knows you from the screen. And that abstraction level uh, causes a situation where um, that other person tends to get a little more aggressive. Uh, he, he discussed a, a change control that uh, was being proposed and it, it could have had a potential for some, uh, you know, some downtime. And uh, the other person who was presenting the change control got absolutely mad at him. And it was a one to one conversation to the point where you, you wouldn't have seen that in a face to face conversation. Um, so do you have any tips uh, for people that are working remotely uh, that uh, can kind of help them and guide them through this process? You know, now that we become much more abstracted, you know, due to this medium Zoom and, and remote work. Yeah, actually, I have a couple of stories there. Um, first, to add on to the point of how face to face communications can help. Um, one of the experiences I had in the past is I was supporting a call center and they absolutely refused to have downtime, but their backend infrastructure for the telecom was at the time six years old. It was past end of life. It was to the point where if they upgraded the network stack that supports it, it wouldn't work anymore. So they, they got to the point where they needed that upgrade, but the, the call center director didn't understand that. Um, in a face-to-face -face conversation, I'm like, so what would you do in an emergency if the building lost all power? Oh, we have a, a, a backup service, third-party service provider that we use. Oh, really? Okay. Well, now we can use that and supplement that for your downtime while we do the upgrade. And that wouldn't have been something that would have came out in a virtual conversation because you're at that time focused on the facts. Okay. No, I don't want to do this. And my wall is up. In person, you can kind of have those exploratory conversations easier and so in a virtual environment, you have to practice that. You have to practice having that coach-like conversation. And that's another reason, uh, another skill that I um, kind of improved and harnessed over the pandemic. And I, I now do coaching as well, and mostly to leaders, because that's usually the folks that need it most is as they've transitioned from the technical to now the soft mm -hmm. skills, they have to understand how to work with the business, how to create these strategies that otherwise they would have just been focused on the technical. And now they have to pivot to, okay, this is a risk-based conversation versus, oh, this is a vulnerability that or a patch that we need to put on and that's it. Um, back to working remotely efficiently. It's about finding out the best way that your team or others communicate. Some might be great in the Zoom conversations. Some might be great in having the camera off and having these conversations as if it were a phone. Um, and, and others prefer written conversations like Slack or messaging um, or, or emails. The, the, the thing to find out is how the culture of the organization is. Is it predominantly, hey, when you send something in email, it means like I'm putting my foot down and this is it. Whereas if it were in Slack, yeah, let's have a conversation. Let's discuss it. And over Zoom, it's like, okay, we're having a meeting, but um, I'm not backing down. Um, we, we've escalated to this point where it's past an email and now we have to have this, this meeting about this escalation. So uh, kind of find out how the culture of the organization work and then shape your conversations around that. You'll also notice that there's 
likely a huge divergence in how the technical side of the organization likes to work and communicate, um, i.e. probably more Slack and these um, messages versus the business side that prefers emails and maybe a phone call. They prefer that type of conversation. So uh, figuring out how the different sides of the organization work and then find ways to document and share knowledge. Uh, when we were all butts in seats, it was easy to say, hey, John, you had this situation. I heard you over talking the other day. And uh, how did you solve that? So now we have to go to, OK, um, increase docu documentation for tickets or knowledge bases that when you solve a unique problem in your organization, you really document what was the situation, what was the complication, and then what was the resolution. That way, someone else can search for those keywords, find how you solved it, and then be able to do that. And or you help create a way to scale that resolution to the rest of the organization, uh, create a script that they can use, um, create an automated uh, container that solves this for them, uh, find ways like that uh, to scale your ability to share information. I, I think you've raised some superb points. And, and again, I could delve into all kinds of different areas of that, but the cultural one is very interesting. I mean, I've come from um, large manufacturing companies and and then I work for a startup, quite a small startup, like 150 users. And the communication style was vastly different. I was very much used to, and I don't want to be ageist or anything like that, but I was very much used to working in a, a an old manufacturing company where people are joint 30, 40, 50 years ago and were still working there. And their communication style was much different, much more face-to-face, -face, more kind of traditional sit down and have meetings. Obviously, a startup is a lot more of the younger generation, very passionate. Everything moves a lot quicker. So it's much more slack than that. So it took me a little bit of a while to to kind of get into that. And, and one of the other things you also said is about coaching technical folks, those soft skills. Um, the questions I've got is more about delegation. And the reason I asked that question is because I came from a technical background. I did a lot of technical certifications. I love being a technical person. And fortunately or unfortunately for me, I, I was quite good at it, which meant I got promoted. And I actually got promoted into a managerial role, which a lot of companies seem to do. And I got promoted into an area where I had no experience. Yes, I was a good technical person. I had the skills to do it. And then suddenly I've got a team of something like 16 people working for me. And really no experience and no particular training I was given. So I found myself trying to do 16 people's work because I didn't know how to delegate. I, it wasn't a skill I'd learned. I, I, I had historically been given a task by my manager, either independently or as part of a team, and I would go off and I would do that task. Suddenly, my manager has given me the tasks for a team of 16 people and I can't cope with not knowing whether those tasks were going to get done or not and feeling completely responsible and therefore trying to do them all. So my question to you is, if you end up in that position, how what, what, how do you delegate? Is Are there, and I'll ask John, because we've never spoke about this, I'll ask you after, but what what is your advice to somebody that's kind of now in a position where they're responsible for all this additional work because they have a team. How, how do you delegate? How do you kind of get comfortable with giving over those reins to somebody else? Well, I'd say very young in my career, I, I was looked to as someone to help coach and mentor individuals. And I didn't have all the answers. What I did is I found the individuals on the team that had those superpowers and asked them to do it and then use their superpowers and then where they had weaknesses, there's another team member that was able to fill in those. So I was able to, to create responsibilities in the teams that blended well with the team members. And the, I inherited that team, so I didn't build it. Um, when you're building a team, you, you can do that yourself. Um, 
Now, with regards to your situation, yes, the, the larger organization you go, you'll have responsibility potentially for um, 16 people or 16 managers that have 16 people under each of those. And you're responsible for the outcome. You have to shift away from understanding and trying to micromanage at the task level and you provide direction, this is the outcome that I'm looking for. Let's create a solution together on how to get there. And then you enable and empower your team members to do that. And then that way, you also make sure that also ensures that you can have a vacation. Because if you're not the one responsible for making sure all the dots get, gets connected, someone can fill in for you while you're gone. If you're the one micromanaging everything, making sure it's happening, you'll feel like you can never go on vacation because things will break. So that that's another way to see if you're really uh, a good manager is to kind of shift away, take a day off. If things break while you take one day off, uh, that, that's kind of a warning flag that uh, something's broken and you need to go back and figure out why. I think that's really good advice. So, John, I'm going to pivot the question to you. What I mean, you obviously started off very similar kind of area to me, technical area, and then you ended up leading quite highly successful teams. How did you deal with the fact that somebody else was kind of doing that stuff? How did you back off and leave it alone? Yeah, that that was one of the hardest uh, moments uh, in it. And it was very visible in my memory. Um, essentially, what happened was uh, I, I I couldn't couldn't drop my uh, chair time on a router and you know I wanted to configure routers I wanted to configure switches and at the time I was running the network team um, to the point where one of my engineers came up to me and goes hey I I need you to stop that and you're not helping the team um, I need you to be strategic so a dude called me out and uh, he was hundred percent right and um, that at that point I was like all right well I, I can't keep doing this technical stuff I, i've gotta gotta get my eyes out and start to look over the horizon uh and think about what's coming down the pipe think about you know how management is uh bringing down projects on us and and all of those things that go into management but it was a very early lesson uh yeah. in my career as as a leader uh but uh, one i took to heart and uh uh, became the ultimate macro manager <laughs> to the point where a lot of people are like, oh, what are you saying? Um, but it, it, it's about basically empowering your people. And the further you rise up in an organization, the less um, opportunity you have to be tactical. You have to be more yeah. strategic and in a sense, not tell them how to do it. Just give them, hey, this is where we're going. I need you to figure out. It's very much like in the military. If you're a general, you're not a tactical person. You're not going to tell the lieutenant, you know, how to deploy his troops. You're going to say, hey, here's the objective. Here's the here's the rules of engagement. Go. Now you plan it out and you, you know, go seize that hill or whatever it may be. Um, the further you go up the chain, the more abstracted you need to be uh, and the more empowering you need to be to your teams. So that that's that's kind of how I learned how not to be so, yeah, micromanaging. I, I, I think I, I think I struggled in in my early days and and we all I, do. I, I had a I, I was lucky to have some very good kind of managers in my time. I call them leaders, really, the managers. And I remember really struggling to delegate to my team. And he pulled me to one side one day and he said to me, I allowed you to make mistakes. And you have got to where you are today because I allowed you to make those mistakes. And I didn't give you too much grief for making those mistakes. Obviously, he didn't let me make constant mistakes. He would remind me if I'd done it twice, probably not a good idea to do it a third time. But he allowed me to make those mistakes. And he said, if you don't allow your team to make those mistakes, they're never going to learn. And then if you do go away for a day or you do go on a holiday, there'll be a raft of mistakes. So I, I took a step back and I found it a little bit easier to delegate. But my biggest issues with delegation was if I was going through a difficult part in my life, if I was under pressure, I was under stress, or I was given a task that I couldn't do straight away and I struggled with, I would fall back to doing the technical work because I could do it 
well. No, I don't mean that to sound arrogant, but I was so familiar with doing it that I could configure a switch or a router. I could configure a VMware kind of setup. I could create a Windows server. I knew Microsoft Exchange pretty well. If I was under pressure and my boss had said, go off and write a strategy, and I was struggling with it, I would find myself kind of getting back in the trenches and being involved again because it gave me that comfort factor. And it was only really in the last few years before before I left my last company that I thought if I don't bring the team up to speed, I won't be able to leave because they will hold on to me. The, the management will hold on to me. So in the last project I did with the previous company, I literally just observed. And it was really at that point when I sat there and just observed and the project went very, very successfully. I realized now, now I can go, I can, I can move on because the team meant so much to me. I really wanted them to be successful and I didn't want to be responsible for failure. But at that point I knew that I didn't need to be on the sidelines anymore, that they could do it on their own. Um, uh, oh, sorry, go on, Chris. I was going to say a great analogy for technical folks, how to explain this is a startup, everything's in prod. As you start to improve, um, th then you have a dev environment and a prod environment. So they can make some mistakes in dev and, and then they'll go to prod. And then when you're really mature, you have a dev, you have a test, you have a QA, <laughs> yeah. like you have those multiple different areas to, uh, check quality to test for bugs all these things but that's that's an example of how you mature in leadership you go yeah. from testing everything on the fly to hey how about you go off and you develop your solution uh you test it out and then you come to me when you're ready and, and then we'll release it and then it's like oh well maybe we'll have one of your engineers also uh, do a qa check on your code and then now it's like, okay, well, let's put in technical controls. Let, let's have this um, security software check for these bugs and these vulnerabilities so you don't have to do it manually. And that takes off the load. And then not, now you can go. So as you rise in the levels, um, the, the, the boundaries for them to test in different ways and to yeah. fail in different ways are there, but they become very... Uh, controlled because you've learned what the mistakes are, where they are, how they are, and, and you can sit back and watch them do it and, and only jump in if there's an emergency and yeah. help them. Um, the other thing that I was going to say is one of the, the, the switches in management culture that I love that's starting to happen today is that you're starting to realize that there's some people that are not people managers, not at all. So you're starting to create roles like staff engineers that, hey, um, you're really good at the technical. How about you stay there, right? And you can advise the engineers and you can create strat technical strategy and all of that and stay technical. Um, and we'll have someone here that knows how to work with people and how to grow people and grow the business, uh, they'll focus on that aspect. And that, that's one of the pivots that I've loved yeah. seeing over the past couple of years that now they're, they're separating out and saying, hey, not everyone needs to be a people manager or a, a business leader. You're, you're, you're now refining the roles. I think historically, we just had a single ladder Everyone started at the bottom and you just climbed. And what that meant is you went from being maybe technical to being a manager to managing more people, da, 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 and you kind of went up this ladder. What people are now doing is being able to jump across ladders and there are different paths you can take. And I think that's a good thing because I know so many people that have been at companies, been very good at what they were doing. So we've been promoted and now they're in something they don't really want to do. They don't necessarily enjoy it. And it's beyond their control. And I think fundamentally, and you alluded to this at the start of this kind of podcast, is you need to be happy what you do. And I quite often say that on LinkedIn and we talk about on the podcast that and it was something my mum said to me when I was very, very young. I was maybe 14 or 15 years old. And we had somebody come into our school and talk about careers. Now, 
I had no idea what I wanted to do at 14 years old. I mean, I, I do. I wanted to be an astronaut, but I never had any real idea of how or what I could actually do. And I remember being really nervous because there was a lot of people in the school that knew exactly what they wanted to do. And I had no idea. And I went home to my mum and I said, I'm really nervous, mum. I feel under pressure that I need to have something like I need to drive towards something. And she said, I don't really care what you do in the future. I just want you to be happy. Find something that makes you happy. And I remember throughout my kind of time at university, I still had no idea what I wanted to do. And I sat down with her a few times and she's like, just do something you like. Because if you get out of bed every morning to go to work and we all work quite hard, we've got long hours that we work, it has to be something you like. And funnily enough for me, I kind of fell into IT. It is lucky that I like it because it is busy. I mean, we've we've all probably slept in computer centers on the floor or in offices. We've all done those things. Um, we had to reschedule this podcast a number of times because they're all really, really busy people. But I think that's one bit of advice or two bits of advice. Make sure you do something that you're really happy doing. And secondly, if you are a leader or a manager or whatever you want to call yourself, you have to acknowledge that your staff may make mistakes. So empower them to go out and make those mistakes. And I'm not saying let them make the same mistake over and over and over again. We shouldn't do that. But people are going to fail because we learn from failing. Um, I want to pivot slightly because um, I just looked at the clock and time's ticking really quickly. Three interesting points that I want to point out. Go, go for it. And then I've got one more question before we get onto the fun stuff. Okay. Oh, um, life is like a game of shoots and ladders now. Um, you can go up the ladder. You can go down the ladder. There's lots of different roles to do. Yeah. Uh, so that, that, that was one thing that I wanted to mention. And then the other thing is with my coaching, the first step that I do is I go back to self-discovery, is working with my clients to figure out what makes them happy. Because they could be a manager that loves to solve this type of problem. So what they have to do is find ways to show their value in that area. And it could be that they eventually move over to just being a, a a manager that solves this problem, and then they can solve this problem in other companies, or they become someone that just likes to be a generalist or whatever, but kind of take that step back to your self-discovery, your core, and figuring out, like you said, what makes them happy. Um, so yeah, I want to touch those points. Now we can move on to the fun no, stuff. No, absolutely. I, I mean, good points. Um, okay, so you've got on LinkedIn that you are a VC so, right? And I see a lot of things come up. A lot of people are like, what does that mean? So I'm going to ask you the question. Is somebody in that role? What what does it mean? What does that? I mean, most people don't even know what a CISO does. So it gets even more confusing. But what, do, what does that role mean to you? And what do you think it should mean to businesses? So I think the role has evolved over time. But the 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 core aspect of the role is that they are a virtual or a fractional CISO. And a CISO is a chief information security officer. So as a virtual CISO, you come in and you help organizations on a fractional basis, um, either sometimes leading the, the information security practice or uh, for larger organizations, you're providing advice and guidance to a security leader in that organization. Um, another other times that I've seen them come in is where they're looking to set up a program for a startup to get the, the foundations there and sometimes even work the process where they are hiring the first security leader for that organization. Yeah. Um, other times I've seen it where they will come in, they have someone in IT that's leading um, the general practice, but they just need some guidance in um, how to do vulnerability management and set up a program or how to do things like um, GDPR, privacy, how to do um, uh, breach notifications, things like that, where you have a, a, a small problem or a small block of time and you, you just need that resource to come in for that. Um, think of it like a project manager for 
cybersecurity, you should have a, a defined outcome that you're looking for them to do, um, usually within a set period of time. Sometimes you can um, reserve them for blocks of time, um, have them on contingency where you call them up and you have a block of hours for, for the month or the quarter. Uh, other times it's like, well, I'll just call you up if, if there's an emergency and um, we'll pay you as we need to. Uh, so those are the different ways that I've seen them been employed. Um, now, a, a VC so tends to need to have that leadership experience, that experience across the different areas within cybersecurity. And some of the, the challenges that we've seen with the dilution of this, this title is that you have consulting companies uh, advising VCSO services, but they're really being staffed with very young consultants that might not have that leadership experience, that strategic experience, and they're just coming in and solving the the, technic the tactical problems versus creating a, a, a strategic implementation for the organization to then take and grow on. Um, so that, that's some of the challenges that I've yeah. seen with that, with that title and that name. And do you see more VCSOs in like mid-sized companies that don't have like a dedicated security function? It goes across the board. I've seen very high companies where they'll uh, have a former CISO come in um, and advise them in yep. a merger and acquisition or a divestiture. Or it's typically a very complex project where they want the current security leader maybe focused on the strategic vision. Yep. and want to distract them from that. So they bring in uh, additional hands to help guide on the special project that needs to be done. Um, but, but it also goes down to uh, venture capital companies that might have an in-house CISO yeah. that's essentially a VC. So advising all of the companies that um, are being supported by this venture capital backer to it really ensure that their money is not going to be yeah. wasted, not going to explode in uh, a cyber incident or a breach uh, because they didn't have the foundations in place. So they provide them with this resource to ensure that you're growing in uh, a structured fashion and um, cybersecurity is not just left in the waste bin. No, because for me, I think it plays a crucial role in businesses. I mean, I think a CISO plays a crucial role um, but when we look around the cyber industry, there seems to be quite a few gaps in, in availability of resource because actually the cyber arena is relatively new. So you don't have the same number of people that you would in IT, for instance, because IT is 30 years old. So I think the role's very good. Um, but I want to pivot maybe. We've got only – go, go for it. I think – the, the quote unquote gap um, is both an inflicted problem uh, as well as a expectation problem. So let, let's talk about it. So from an education perspective, um, being a young industry, we haven't really developed what's set as the foundation. Every industry has a different set of foundations. So we can't say, okay, everyone that's gone through um, this certification or this degree, um, you're ready for a junior analyst role. So every company now has to spend some time to develop these junior um, individuals. The problem is no one wants to develop these junior individuals and create that talent pipeline. They want to say, hey, I have this need here and it requires someone with experience and therefore we're just going to hire someone with experience. But they'll have people here that they could have grown into that role, hired someone more junior, cost less, invested that extra education in the mid-tier and they would have solved their problem. The, the, everyone's short-sighted when it comes to 
the development of their talent pipeline. And it's something that organizations need to think about at a strategic level, because right now everything's like, we have this project that needs to be done in this quarter and we don't want to spend too much because it'll affect our um, stock price or it'll affect our earnings. So everything's being short-sighted when it comes to spend and then you're complaining about the gap. So it's both the government as well as organizations need to help invest in developing our next generation um, to have that foundation, to even have that general awareness of what security is. Every kid these days in middle school has a device. They know how to use it, but they don't necessarily know how to use it securely. So if we teach them how to use it securely from the time that they're in school, by the time they get to the workforce, they have that security culture already in their minds. And that really helps them to be prepared to be security champions within an organization. And when you have a security champion and a security culture within your organization, one security resource can really amplify that effect to the rest of the organization. So you don't really need an equal amount of IT and security. Uh, you can have less security because they already have a, a fundamental understanding of what they need to do. They just potentially need some guidance in the technical areas. I, I mean, I could speak to you for at least another hour. So we're, we're definitely going to have to have you back on because I want to talk about training youngsters. I want to talk about what you think about zero trust. I want to think more about and talk more about how security should be seen as a kind of a enabler in the business and all that. So we will definitely have to get you back on, but time's really ticking. Well, maybe, been... maybe Jay, Jay, maybe this is a Simon and Simon Magnum PI crossover and we just go on his show. That's what we should do. We're coming on your show and we'll just follow on. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> but I, I do want to ask you a question about. Um, I'll, I'll pivot it in getting your advice for developing those people and you'll be the ones answering those questions absolutely <laughs> we can we can do that um i can't have a podcast without asking the guest about food i, I just can't do it i mean it, it food means everything to me um please tell me you don't have pineapple on pizza but i'm not even going to ask you because it will upset me with your answer um I've pivoted my question a little bit. I used to just say, what's the best thing you've ever eaten? And now I asked a question in regards to like food experience, because it's not always the food that's important. It's where it was, who you were with and all that kind of stuff. So what's been your kind of best food experience is the question. Well, first to the pizza, um, I've learned to love one of my wife's favorites, which is thin crust barbecue um with jalapeno and onions um really nicely maybe overly done so there's a nice crisp to it yeah uh, that's really good um as for the best food experience um i went to a polynesian restaurant with my wife and they have the dancing and the food and i i would say that's been one of my best experiences because you're, you're using all of your senses uh literally um in that experience yeah. um and i would say anytime you can do that um you really hit the box there sounds good one for you john what's your question uh, travel. Uh, where is, uh, if you had to pick one place to go in the world, uh, where would it be? Well, since I grew up in the Caribbean, um, I, I think I've experienced there a lot, but, um, on my hit list is Hawaii and Thailand, mm. uh, both places with incredible beauty and incredible culture. And that's one of the things that I love, um, is experiencing the local culture and learning yeah. from locals when I travel. See, I've, I have been very lucky to to visit quite a lot of Asia and Thailand was one of those places. And John, I believe you've been there, right? Yeah. yeah the key so, is to get out, the, is to get out of Bangkok. So I, I've flight. never been, I've never been to Hawaii and I know you've been to both. If you had mm -hmm. to pick Thailand or Hawaii, which one would you pick? <laughs> I like both of them. 
Uh, for me, going to Hawaii is a five hour flight, so it's very easy and it's very yeah. relaxing and, 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 uh, uh, but I do like Thailand. Uh, it depends on who I'm going with. If I'm taking the kids, it's Hawaii. If it's just me and my wife, uh, Thailand. Good, good shout. And so, Chris, I want to thank you for coming on. I had a whole bunch of questions that we haven't even gotten to. You've been so insightful. It's been great. We we definitely have to do this again. Um, you, you've got so much experience and you put it in such a great way that I really hope our listeners understand what, what you're saying and how beneficial those things can be. Um, but it's it's been an absolute blast. I thank you. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll give a shout out for one more place to travel to. And that's Belgium. Um, they have mm, amazing yes. chocolate. They yep. actually created French fries and they have more than one different type of beer for every day of the year. So they yes. have over 365 different yep. types of beer that they brew locally um, in such a small country. I'll follow up with that. One of the best meals I've had is in Bruges, uh, yeah. in the central oh. park there, the central area where uh, one of the big cycling races starts, uh, Tour of Flanders, mm -hmm. and um, just had mussels soaked in yeah. beer. Amazing experience. Bruges is lovely. Love very that. good, very good where chocolate. My, mom, my mom's from, and my granddad had a place there. And when I lived in Belgium, I had the opportunity to live in Bruges inside oh. the city circle yes. uh, with horses that come by on the cobblestone streets with um, a French fry place right next door and a waffle yeah. place across the street and a brewery across the street. So I uh, never had to travel very far. Now I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Jay's getting on an airplane. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming on. And no doubt we'll talk again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.